Hello and welcome to interest.co.nz. I'm Janae Tibshirani and today I'm joined by Professor Sia Hui Ang for another one of our double shot interviews. Sia is the BNZ Chair in Business in Asia at Victoria University. Welcome Sia, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, China and the Chinese property investors have unfortunately been at the centre of a number of racially fuelled headline grabbing media reports in recent times. Today I'd like to discuss China through a more Chinese centric lens and bring a bit of context to some of the talk that's been thrown around. So to begin with Sia, um, what, what is happening in China at the moment and what is sparking people to um, you know, get their money out of China and invest it elsewhere? I think part of the um, challenges in China is that there's only so many things you can buy in China. Say, for example, in China, you probably can't buy any land in China, and that's because it's owned by the government, literally, right? So, so we are talking about investing in property. But then if you are thinking about property, then there's always a restriction as in there's only so many properties you can buy where you can stick your name on top of all these property as an owner as well. Mm. So some older generations also doesn't really want to basically uh, invest in the stock markets as well, right? So as a result of that, there are limitations in spending the millions and millions of savings. And for the same reason, there's quite a lot of investors trying to look out of China whereby they can actually spend that kind of money that we're talking about, millions and millions of dollars to which you can buy property, apartments and everywhere around the world. Mm. So they are spreading around quite a lot as a result of that. Right, and, and as you're saying, these are, um, you know, professional investors as well as mums and dads, regular people. Yep, they include everyone. And, and basically the last uh, sort of one of those reports that I've come across is that we are actually not the only one as well. So they have actually populated the whole of US. They have actually spread out in Canada to the extent that there is a limitations on the number of um, residence permit, right, that can be awarded in Canada. Mm. They have also been in the Aussies all the time, right? And so we are just one of those few countries that they find that it's actually very livable, right? So that's why they start to invest uh, in these countries, including us. Mm. And this is the thing, what makes New Zealand an attractive place? And I mean, how, how viable is it, or how easy is it to invest in New Zealand relative to other places? Um, I don't think we are necessarily the easiest to invest in, but at the same time, I think in some ways we are, we are one of those holiday places for them. And we haven't been on the radar for a long time. US is always one of those, the Canada and the Australian. And then, of course, New Zealand has always been a very popular tourism place. Mm. And only until recent years that we start to have this kind of um, uh, uh, sort of running out of space kind of thing. So when they find that they find it very difficult to get residents in UK or Canada, they start to look for alternatives. And that's where New Zealand comes into play. Mm. right? And that's where New Zealand starts to have a lot of inquiry about you know, our... Uh, what can be purchased within New Zealand, right? And, well, the good news and the bad news is that a lot of things can be purchased here, mm. right? Which also means that they are here for the same reason. Mm, sure. And, and what is the Chinese psyche behind investing? I mean, New Zealanders traditionally have invested in property because values have, have usually always gone up and we value owning and living in our own home. What do Chinese people think? Yeah, I think... In, in general, property is safer than stocks, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, again, uh, if you're talking about stocks, they know it's going to go up and down. But if you think about places in general, very few countries has property prices coming down. Very unusual, right? Mm -hmm. and, and when you have one of them here, 10 of them will come. When you have 10 of them here, a hundred will come and then the price will keep going up, right? And you never almost never come down for the same reason as well. And and they come in bunches, so they are huge and it's almost impossible to to argue that, you know, at some stage they will they will stop coming unless there's some restriction in terms of uh, you know uh, how much uh, Chinese can buy uh, in in this country. Otherwise there's no stopping them. Mm -hmm. mm. And um, what has the effect been of um, the the stats that the Labour Party released about the, the Chinese surnames and the sort of huge debacle that that's caused. Um, what type of fallout has that caused in China? Uh, I think we have to understand about you know purchasing land and property. Right. What what this means is a business transaction. So so when we start thinking that the um, you know 
start using things like Chinese investors and so on. We 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 actually accidentally trash pass into an area where we start talking about you know different ethnic groups, different race. We actually we don't want to go there because any property purchase is considered a business transaction. And if you about think about it that way, it's very normal for Chinese to buy land here or property here because uh, well a lot of them are very rich. Right, and they mm. can afford that, right? And if, of course, others who can afford that, I'm sure there are a lot of other nationalities that buy property here as well, right? Mm. I mean, accidentally we single out the Chinese because there are so many of them, right? And that's mm. the law of large numbers, basically. They are more significant because there are more of them. Yeah. And then we bring them out as a part of the discussion. And, and, and the more we discuss some sort of things, sometimes it ends up being less of a business case rather than more like a very personal or ethnic issues or, or race issues kind of a case. At the end of the day, right, uh, any buyer can only buy if there's a seller. Right, so sometimes you have to think about the uh, supplies end of things as well. So, if there's no supply, then there won't be a demand. They won't be able to come here to buy if nobody is selling. So somebody must be selling, mm. right? To start with, right? Mm, mm. Sure. Okay. And see, so, uh, while we talk about um, Chinese people investing in New Zealand, it's also important to look at look at the opposite, and um, mm. you know the importance of New Zealanders investing money in China and also exporting to China. Mm. Um, do you think we are taking advantage of, of the opportunities available to do this? Um, I think we can do a lot more, yeah. right? I, I can see individuals investing in China uh, quite a bit, traveling quite a lot in China. I can also see a lot of New Zealand organizations trying very hard in China and, and a lot of them are thinking about it, right? And and one thing is for sure, right, when, when I mean, coming from the organizational perspective at least, right, so if a New Zealand company is thinking about China, don't think that you will lose the opportunity tomorrow. So you don't rush into it because it's a big market. So if you have a good product, you always have a market in China. There is no such thing as the market is going to stop at the end of this year, for example. Right, so mm. it's not going to stop. So it, it's always going to be there. It's a huge market. So, so you have to think very hard as to what you want to do in China. And there's a lot of exporting opportunities and investment opportunities. And and in this particular case, I would encourage more firms to think about investment opportunities as opposed to just exporting. Mm. Okay. Mm. All right. Okay. And um, if we, I just want to talk about exporting first. Um, mm. The you deal you know advise a number of exporters and and business people. What are some of the biggest challenges that they face, and perhaps mistakes that they make when mm. they enter the the Chinese market? Yeah, I think if you actually track back to the um, the literature around you know what kind of things you can do when you enter a foreign country, I think export exporting is the most distant approach. Right, uh, of market entry into any country. Now, what it means is that basically, you know, if you are a local distributor in China, so basically what happens is that I pass you my commodity or product and then you sell it for me in China. Now, that is a very distant approach, mm. right? What it means is that I'm, ex I'm the exporter, you are the distributor and you interact with the clients, right? Now, there's an issue here, of course, right? In the long run, basically you and the client, uh, if I'm the exporter, then I'm actually quite distant away from the client because you are the connector to the clients, sure. right? What it means is that the client has a connection with you but not with me, mm. right? And over time, as these kind of relationships continue to build, it, it can become a challenge because it becomes a relationship that is strong between you and the clients, right? And very weak between me and the clients, which also means that, uh, you know, you can come back to me and say, oh, can I bargain for a bit more power? Right in this relationship here, mm. because I deal with the clients, you are not. You are just supplying me the product, right? So, so I think from the exporting perspective, I think you know you have to be very careful in using this kind of distance approach, right? Uh, if you ever use a distributor, always try to understand what they do. Always try to be engaged with part of what they do, as opposed to say, look, I just pass the product to you. You handle the clients. I think it's not a very uh, smart way to do it. Right. Sure, sure, and that, I mean that might involve actually getting some language skills and and having some some presence in China. Yeah, yeah, and and that's part of the uh, the exercise of saying trying to know the market, right? Yeah. We don't know the market by just studying here from here and basically say, look, I think that's a great market. Pass to the distributor; they can execute it for us. I think it's not a great idea. I think it's always good to say that you know there's a market there. 
you better you need some help locally for a distributor to help you no doubt okay that's fine but you still have to be involved in the market mm. itself right to understand a bit more so that you can actually even do much more than that sure and um what what are your thoughts about exporters taking a single desk approach in, in the way that zespri has done mm. Uh, without going too much about uh, talking about Zespri, right? Well, I think the single desk approach is actually, uh, you know, in, in one perspective, is actually quite good because in New Zealand, we don't have critical mass. A lot of organizations are too small and, you know, uh, it depends on how much they know as well. Most of them know their industry very well, but when it comes to the macro environment, you see, given that a lot of dynamics are quite different so for example just to give you an example right i mean the dairy prices comes down the currency comes down the tourism goes up mm. right okay so there is a lot of a uh, ripple effect going on there mm. right so a lot of this some of these industries know their industry well but that doesn't mean you know the uh, macro environment well right so for mm. the same reason uh, people have to understand that uh, you know having this this is called one stop whereby everyone flows through the same system allows that critical mass and sharing of understanding, mm. which is good news, right? Yeah. From the New Zealand's perspective of being small in general. But at the same time, right, it has to be sure that this single stop has to be the strong uh, kind of um, sort, sort of the uh, strong front to everything right so this single stop has to have single desk has to have very good governance structure to make sure that what it's actually doing is representing New Zealand right so we can't afford that single desk to fail or not do well because it just come back and bite the New Zealand brand in general that's what it is as well so so I'm not discouraging the single desk but the structure of using a single desk has to be well thought out before everything falls back onto New Zealand and it affects other industry as well as they move into these countries. Mm, sure. And has Fonterra, is that, is that well thought out enough? Uh, I think in, in some ways, I think in my view, right, uh, it's a personal view anyway. So it's like, you know, the farmers are taking quite a lot of risks, right, in what Fonterra is doing. So Fonterra does have the um, ethical so called of ethical rights to actually performed uh, as expected by the farmers right so so in some ways i think both parties should be on the same ship and i think in terms of structure then both have to share the cost and the consequences right of mm. uh, performing it so you i mean in the farm the farmers in this case ends up to be the kind of uh, arrangement that i have actually just said before right? i pass the thing to you and then you execute it with the client as a distributor but now it's saying that you come back to me and say that basically i should uh, you know uh, lower my price as a result of you not dealing well with your clients right as a distributor so there is a, a kind of um, sharing risk that is necessary in this kind of arrangements as opposed to one party in this particular case with Fonterra that one party is actually sh taking more risk than the other the other one and the party that is taking more risk is not purely engaged in the execution mm. right strategy of what is going on out there with the dairy products sure okay all right um and just to touch on investment what are some of the um biggest challenges you see new zealand is facing when they invest in china uh, I think not many New Zealand uh, companies are actually investing heavily right, in mm. China and that's because we have the fundamental um, entry mode of uh, exporting. Right? So uh, in some ways we always compare ourselves and say look I think we uh, export uh, even though we export a lot but we are still less than 40% of GDP which means that we can still increase it to 40% which means that we can work towards more exporting mm. but what they have forgotten is that if you look across countries around the world uh, especially those that are about similar size or similar attributes in terms of uh, the, the industry structures right you might actually see that a lot of these economies um, sort of in some ways they are not just doing exporting they are doing a lot of investments as well ODI Mm -hmm. right and that's something that New Zealand is seriously lacking right and and in some ways we are running at a target of exporting when other countries are actually doing both at the same time right okay. and and that's something that I think to start with we need to have the mentality that exporting is not the only solution mm -hmm. right or the not the only way to engage 
right? Sometimes investment is probably the better way because it's more committed because you have to be there to understand your clients. And sometimes one can argue that some firms don't do export and purely do investment as well. So that's another thing to be considered as well. So, so the challenge of turning around and thinking about exporting is the first solution. Right, is something that we have to make the organization start learning that exporting is not necessarily the first solution or the only solution there. Mm-hmm. Um, is there anything the government can do to um, promote or help facilitate um, exporters to sort of expand into to, to investing? Yeah, I think the government is trying uh, quite a bit of, um, you know, by setting up a lot of free trade agreements and, and so on. And there's so always a lot of uh, bilateral investment um, agreements that's going around in these countries. What, what it needs to be done is that um, the government can be more involved in businesses and, and tell them exactly what kind of policies are in place and what kind of agreements are in place that can facilitate that. But that requires both parties to come and meet halfway. Right, because I find that a lot of businesses don't spend time tracking what the country or what kind of agreements the country has with other countries. Mm-hmm. I also find that the businesses are not tracking enough of who is doing what in those countries that they are interested in. Right? At the same time, uh, the government can move closer right, by having a lot more platforms to which businesses and government are coming together in a forum. Right, like a few of those that have attended more recently, but a lot more can be done in that particular space. Sure. All right. Okay. Well, see. Thank you so much for your time. Um, appreciate that, and you've, mm. you've raised a number of points, which you know, food for thought there. So, thank you for that. Thank you. I'm Janae Tibshirani, and I've been joined today by Cia Wee Ang here at interest.co.nz.